Woo, this is the penultimate AS level revision video. It's about the fiscal policy, and that is part of the national economy section of economics AS level with AQA. You'll probably remember the fiscal policy from GCSE you did about government spending and taxation. Later on in this video, we're going to look at the impact of the fiscal policy on both aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So both demand side fiscal policy and supply side fiscal policy, they're probably things that are new to you from GCSE. Automatic stabilisers are basically changes in government income and expenditure that are dependent on government activity itself. So for example, if the government increased its expenditure, uh, perhaps as part of the expansionary fiscal policy, that would lead to an increase in employment because it would be providing more jobs and services in the public sector. And that would lead to a increase in tax income and a decrease in benefits expenditure because there will be more people that are employed, so there will be more people paying income tax and less people claiming benefits. So basically that's the impact on government expenditure and income of a government action. Now we're going to look at three different types of government spending that are within the fiscal policy. So we've got current spending, capital spending and transfer payments. Current spending is government spending on the running of the public sector, for example on raw materials or the wages of the public sector workers. So here I suppose we're actually spending on the factors of production themselves, whereas in capital spending we're trying to improve the factors of production. So we're trying to improve productive capacity, for example, education and training. Hospitals, obviously if people are ill they're not going to be working, so we've got reduced productive capacity for lots of ill people. Infrastructure, if you've got roads that are getting jammed up, people are going to take longer to get to work, so you know they'll spend less time at work, more time in traffic, so we'll be producing less. And finally, transfer payments, which are very obvious, like which one, the first thing in everyone's head when they think transfer payments, benefits. It's essentially government payments to individuals for which they receive no service. So benefits, job seekers allowance, stuff like that. Transfer payments are pretty much all to do with equity, improving equity within the economy. Obviously it's not very fair if there are some people that are unemployed, unable to get a job, who simply cannot live if they haven't got any money coming in. That's why the government pays it to them. Also disabled people, we can't expect some disabled people to work. If you're severely disabled and it's life limiting and stuff like that, you need to get this support from the government to actually have a fulfilled life. We're now going to look at the three different budget states, and this sounds really boring, but it's actually a really important terminology to use in your essays. The examiners lap it up, and to be honest, if you haven't got it in your essay and it's to do with the budgets, then you could lose quite a lot of marks, simply because it's such key terminology, they expect you to know all of these. So we've got a balanced budget, which is when government income is equal to government outcome. So the amount the government's getting in through taxation is the same amount that it is spending on roads, infrastructure, education, training, all the stuff that it spends money on. A budget deficit is when spending is greater than taxation income, so essentially money is going out of the government. And budget surplus is when the amount that the government is getting in is greater than the amount that it's spending. We've actually been in a budget deficit for quite a while, unfortunately, which isn't really so good. Although, obviously, it has the fiscal policy influence, I suppose, of increasing aggregate demand which could be deemed to be good for economies at certain levels. Obviously, when you get higher up and you're on the straight part of the aggregate supply curve, it's not so good. But when we're lower down on the aggregate supply curve, an increase in aggregate demand does lead to a massive increase in output, which is quite good. The budget actually balances itself over time, so although we've been in a budget deficit for quite a while at the moment, Hopefully, some point in the hopefully in the near future, let's face it, it'll be the very, very far future, we'll eventually get a budget surplus and be able to balance out our budget. So, in a period of economic upturn, such as within a positive output gap, you'll have increased tax revenue, you'll have more people working, because we know in a positive output gap you've got greater output and therefore greater employment. And because you've got all these people working, you'll have less people not working, so decreased welfare spending. So, you'll have a really nice budget surplus. However, in economic downturn, you'll have decreased tax revenue. For example, in negative output gap, you've got less output and thus less employment. You've got high unemployment, you've got less people paying income tax, and you've got to spend more on paying their benefits. And job seekers allowance and stuff like that, so you'll have a budget deficit. Obviously, as we can see here, though, the economic cycle, it just goes over time, so it'll go, you know, negative output gap, positive output gap. The sizes differ, obviously, depending on whereabouts in the cycle you are, how the cycle's going that period, but essentially it will keep changing over time. So hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to balance out the budget. 
It's important to note that being in a positive output gap doesn't necessarily mean you can have a budget surplus because there are so many other areas that the government spends on and maybe if the government decides it wants to spend loads on improving healthcare, you're still going to be in a budget deficit despite getting loads and loads of money in income tax. Demand side, fiscal policy is probably the one you're more familiar with because it's the one that you talk about quite a lot at GCSE. And demand side fiscal policy is essentially changes in the level and structure of government spending and taxation which aimed at influencing the components of aggregate demand. And we'll look at a more detailed example of that in a second. We've also got the discretionary fiscal policy. It's unlikely that you're going to ever see this, but it's just important if you do see it, you know what it is. It's deliberate manu manipulation, I can't pronounce manipulation right now, deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxation. So we have the expansionary fiscal policy and the contractionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is used in, during periods of economic downturn, sad times. So you've got an increase in government spending and a reduction in taxation. You're trying to stimulate aggregate demand within the economy to cause there to be an increase in output. And you could show this on a curve if you really wanted to but I just couldn't be bothered. Again, in a moment, we're going to look at why this actually does stimulate aggregate demand. Then we have the contractionary fiscal policy. Sounds really daunting. It's actually used during periods of upturn. So you increase taxation and reduce government spending in order to reduce aggregate demand and hopefully reduce inflationary pressure. Here is a table, which is very blurry, but it does show the two different types of like fiscal policies, so we've got expansionary and contractionary. Expansionary fiscal policy is used to reflate the economy, so you want to get economic growth and increased employment. How do you do it? Well, you use a budget deficit. When you're using your budget deficit, that is an increase in government spending. For example, in hospitals, the NHS, if you put more money into the NHS, you'll be able to employ more doctors and nurses. This leads to an increase in employment because we've provided more jobs. And that leads to the positive multiplier effect, woohoo, which means an increase in you know employment leads to an increase in demand, increase in employment, increase in demand, just goes up and up and up in a positive cycle. So you have more and more demand within the economy and more people employed, which means... You know, it's really good for the eco uh, economy, actually, because it leads to a budget surplus, hopefully, if you can do it right for the government. Then we have taxation. The government reduces taxation. Not only is this brilliant in terms of fiscal policy, but it also makes everyone really happy. So everyone's like, woohoo, reduce tax, because tax is the only thing that everyone cares about. Which, like, If you don't know about the economy, you're like, tax, 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 I hate it so much. But obviously we really do need tax, otherwise we wouldn't be able to fund any of the stuff we fund. Anyway, that's totally off topic and random. If the government reduces taxation, as it tends to do when you're using expansionary fiscal policy, that will increase the disposable income of people out there. So people are spending more, you know, they're demanding more, consumption rises, aggregate demand rises, positive multiplier effect, more employment, stuff like that. So this is used especially when you're trying to increase employment. Obviously, if you increase employment, you increase demand, and increased demand it leads to economic growth because you're demanding more for output. Just imagine a shift on the aggregate demand curve, aggregate supply curve. You'll have your aggregate demand curve, and it'll be crossing your aggregate supply curve, and the aggregate demand curve will shift right. And if you imagine that on the Keynesian curve, you'll see there is a increase in output. Woo! However, you've got to be careful, because if you shift it too far right, as we've seen on lots and lots of diagrams in previous videos, that could lead to inflation, which is now good. Obviously, inflation has really serious costs, which are again on another video, so I'm not going to go through them again for like the fifth time. And then we have contractionary fiscal policy, which is deflating the economy. That's the main aim here is reducing inflation. I mean, you can also reduce the balance of payments deficit, but if you're talking contractionary fiscal policy, you're probably trying to reduce inflation using a budget surplus. So the government would decrease spending, for example, on benefits, which reduces the income of everyone. So say before you've got £10 a week, now you get £5 a week, you're probably going to be starving to death because that is not a lot of money. But you've had a massive reduction in your disposable income, so you've got basically no money, so you're going to reduce your demand, there'll be a left shift of the aggregate demand curve, leading to a reduction in the price level. Yay! And that's also a negative multiplier effect, will lead to more and more unemployment, and therefore a reduction in the price level even further, as the aggregate demand curve shifts further and further left. Obviously that's the major cost of the contractionary fiscal policy, it leads to unemployment. Also, the government increases taxation, so this decreases disposable income further, especially if it's on like income tax, that's a massive chunk of your income that's going away. So you've got a massive reduction in disposable income, so people spend less and consumption expenditure falls. Consumption expenditure? Consumer expenditure. Although consumption does fall as well. So that's a reduction in aggregate demand leading to a negative multiplier effect, you know, less demand, less un less employment, less demand, less employment, goes down, 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 which leads to, you know, if you've got a left shift of the aggregate demand curve, that is leading to a fall in the price level. 
Now we're going to look at the supply side fiscal policy. This is probably new to you because we didn't do it at GCSE, it's just been introduced to us at AS level. It's also quite exciting though. So it's basically changes in the level and structure of government spending and taxation which is aimed at improving the supply side of the economy. So it's essentially aiming to increase our ability to produce goods and services. So it wants to have a left shift of the long run aggregate supply curve. And as you can see there it also reduces inflationary pressure. Now we're going to look at a variety of supply side fiscal policies. Obviously there's quite a big range here, so I've got the words here and then I'm going to talk about each of the different policies I suppose. So we've got the labour market incentives. Basically if we cut welfare benefits it reduces the benefit trap. So I mean the benefit trap is basically when workers receive more through claiming benefits than through working thus they choose to spend their life on benefits. This encourages voluntarily unemployed people to seek work, so if they get less on benefits, they've got a rather uncomfortable standard of living, they'll go look for a job if they've been voluntarily unemployed. Because they've already got the skills, they just need to get back into work. This means that new people enter the labour market, so it increases the capacity of the country to produce, because if we're using more of our facts of production, if we've increased the quantity because we've got less unemployed people, that means that we're going to produce more, so increase the supply within the economy. Also, cutting income tax is another way the government tries to uh, encourage people to get back into the labour market. It encourages people to seek work, maybe work harder, try to get like pay rises, because they know that if they work harder, they get a pay rise, they earn more, less of it's going to be taken away. Not less of it, but it's more of it will be taken away, but it's not oh, such a great amount will be taken away, whereas nowadays, if you earn more than a certain amount, about half your income gets taken away. If the government cuts that, it would encourage people to seek promotions and stuff like that. If people are working harder to try to seek this promotion, that will be an increased productivity. So that's obviously really good because it leads to an increased capacity of the economy to produce and that will be an outward shift of the production possibility boundary. Unfortunately, there's a slight cost to this. If people are thinking, ooh, look, income tax has fallen, I may as well work less and still get the same amount, then people will be working less to get the same amount of money and that will actually reduce the capacity of the economy to produce if more and more people are going part-time. Next, we're going to look at capital spending. So the government improves infrastructure, for example, schools and hospitals, and that's essentially contributing to investment across the whole country. So the government spending on schools is basically investing in the future labour force, I suppose. Capital spending should also be reducing the rate of corporation tax, which means that businesses have more money to spend because less their profits being taken away. So maybe they're going to invest. Maybe they'll invest into machinery. Maybe they're going to invest into more workers. Either way, they're increasing their own capacity to produce. And if more and more businesses do this cross country, total country capacity to produce will increase dramatically. The next one I can sadly never pronounce entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship? Something like that. It sounds a bit like that. It sounds a bit weird. I always thought of entrepreneurialism. Anyway, this is the government trying to encourage people to be entrepreneurial. Oh yeah, check me with my long words. So basically government spending funds expansion in the rate of new business startups, so maybe it will provide loans, because starting a new business is actually really expensive, really high startup costs. But if the government tries to encourage new firms to enter the market, for example, providing loans, providing business support and advice, more firms in the market means a right shift in total supply. This is the short run aggregate supply curve here, but I suppose if you've got more firms in the market and they've got more machines and more firms are employing more people, we're using more of our factors of production and thus we will have an increased capacity to produce. Research, development, innovation. Government spends on businesses, gives them tax credits and tax allowances, and they try to encourage an increase in private sector research and development, for example, into new capital ideas, maybe new products. If, cause for example, if you've got a machine, it can produce five phones an hour, and then someone gets, you know, lent some money or, you know, given a loan, a tax allowance or something, in order that they can research for a bit into a new machine, and they can come up with a new machine that produces 20 mobile phones an hour. I mean, it's, these are still pretty slow machines. Anyway, 20 mobile phones an hour. That increases the productive capacity of the economy by loads, because it can produce so much more in the same period of time. And obviously, an increase in overall productivity leads to a right shift of the long-run aggregate supply curve. And finally, we have our human capital improvements. Woo! That's increased government spending on education and training. That increases the human capital of the workforce. So they've got more qualifications. Maybe they'll have an increased productivity. I mean, that's the main thing. If you've got a trained person doing a job and someone that's untrained doing a job, the trained person is almost guaranteed to be doing it much faster, probably doing it to a better quality as well. So you've got your higher quality and higher productivity, labour productivity for that worker. 
So obviously that's really important if you've got high productivity, greater capacity to produce more, essentially. You're getting more from the same inputs in the same period of time. Another benefit of increasing productivity, of course, is reduced average costs. If you cut average costs, it means you're more competitive on the international market and you can try to get a balance payments surplus. Though, so as the UK, that's so unlikely. More like a balance payments, like a reduced deficit on there. Another thing that comes under human capital improvements is increased government spending on healthcare and transport. The first thing everyone thinks of when you say increased spending on transport is, of course, the HS2 railway, and I've just looked it up, I think it's £46.2 billion pounds they're spending on that, which is a hell of a lot of money, I'm not going to lie. That just sounds ridiculous when you think about it. How can you spend £40 billion on a train? Choo -choo. Is it really going to have that massive an impact on our productivity that it's worth spending so much money on a train? Apparently it is, because if people can get train paces faster, Maybe that will increase the amount of hours they can work and stuff like that. And maybe if they can get out of bed a bit later, they'll be more productive in the day because they won't be so tired. But, I mean, there's such a fierce debate about whether it was right to spend this money on HS2. And I'm afraid I'm not informed enough on the subject to give my opinion. And I probably wouldn't be able to give it anyway because I'm not really meant to share opinions on here, I don't think. But, obviously, the intention of improving the rail world network and stuff like that is the positive supply side effects in the long run. In the future, hopefully, due to HS2, we'll have the ability to supply more. Woo! That's the end of all the fiscal policy stuff. Quite exciting stuff there. I'd say it's not quite as exciting as monetary policy. I thought it was going to be more exciting, actually. I was proper hyped for fiscal policy. But monetary policy, it's just peak. Apparently peak means bad. I always get this mixed up. I always like peak times, meaning woo, best times. And apparently it means bad times. And everyone's like, what the hell? Because I'm like having time in my life, like peak times. No, uh, no. You probably don't care about that little story there. So I uh, hope this video has helped you, aside from that really random story at the end there. Uh, good luck in your exam. Have a lovely day. And I'll see you next time for supply side policy. Exciting times.